Are you tired of listening to German language all day long? Don't you just want to get your news and topics presented in English, even though you live in Germany? Then here's your solution. Yeah! <laughs> Elephant in the Room, an English radio show where we discuss things that people tend to ignore. Tune in on Color Radio on 99.3 and 98.4. Every second and fourth Monday of the month. Elephant in the Room, a radio show by the Black Rose Radio Collective from Dresden. Hate Mondays, be organized, stay cool. Welcome to our today's radio show here by Elephant in the Room in the Color Radio Studio in Dresden. Today we want to talk about women prisons. According to the Federal Statistic Office, 2,996 women were in Germany in prison on the 13th November last year. Who are these women? What are they being punished for? How many of them even identify themselves as women? Prison fulfills a structural function, for example, in the administration of poverty. But what role do women prisons fulfill? How do they help to maintain a patriarchal, gender-biased system? We want today to talk about a gender-specific character of punishment um, on the occasion of the International Women's Campaign on March 8. Um, on this day, or rather one day before, there will be, as the last four years already happened, a march to the women's prison in Saxony in Chemnitz. And this and a lot more you will hear from us this today. What will you have to do as with the criminals then? I asked. Give them medals for daring to be antisocial in the face of an antisocial order. They put humans in a cage and call it justice. Margaret Kleejoy. So um, we're going to start with a kind of more wider question. What is jail anyway? 
So jail is a form of punishment. And punishment is kind of a sanctioning, undesirable or unwanted behavior. And uh, yeah, we can say that different social groups are differently affected by this kind of um, punishment. According to the legal doctrine, a punishment is there to prevent further offenses by deterrence, looking away potential, locking away potential perpetrators, crossing the desire for revenge, uh, processing the desire for revenge, and uh, re-social- re-socialization. What are actually crimes? This will be defined by the current ruling system. But this also can change, as we know, throughout the history. For example, in Germany, homosexuality was a criminal offense till the 1969. In Germany, prison is the highest form of a punishment. There are 186 independent correctional facilities. And women are imprisoned in 45 of them. But there are only seven so-called women's prisons. And all the others are kind of male prisons with a women's section. And in our society, yeah, people are kind of, as I already mentioned, kind of differently affected um, by this kind of punishment. And this we can also see in the prison population. So kind of the composition of the people in the prison reflects the discrimination of the people in our society. For example, with poverty or racism or um, people who are facing discrimination because they are transsexuals. And um, yeah, in our peop- in our society, people are kind of facing different kinds of discrimination by their gender identity or their appearance or their cultural affiliation and many different other aspects. And sometimes there can be even several of those um why the person is more affected by repression. And um, yeah, so eventually prisons are part of our society and also the society is kind of, yeah, is in this kind of prisons. But um, also prisons have a kind of special position in the society because people are specifically or particularly vulnerable there. And prison is, as you might or even not um, imagine a really violent place. And this, of course, not of course, but this kind of reproduces violence and discrimination. So it's not a place where you kind of help people to become better people. And uh, one aspect, um, as we already mentioned, is that there is a kind of a, the prison system works like the general um gender system in this um society so it's a logic that people are usually in the prison by their gender which is in their id and um people who are actually not fitting in this kind of two gender systems in this society have even a bigger problem because they are facing even more violence and yeah inside of the prison but the whole question of this kind of binarity of which is like people who are not fitting in this binary system, we are not going to focus so much because this is a huge own topic. But we're going to really kind of have a look on the history of women prisons. How did they actually develop and how these kind of institutions actually also work today and have specific yeah, issues we're going to talk about today.
We're back in the studio and we want to look at the history of women's prisons. So the practices in women's prisons and in men's prisons have been and are still planned specifically by gender. The private is political and this implies that we understand that our bodies, our relationships, our affections, our ways of having sex, our construction of gender, our language are saturated with power and oppression. Therefore, it is important to question and destroy this. That was a quote from the feminist anarchist newspaper Delira from Chile. When we look into the history, we can see that the disciplining through prison began with the oppression of women, uh, which is actually a fact which has been rarely paid attention as like usually in the modern analysis of prison, prison only appears with the appearance of men's prisons, like um, in this book of Foucault, um, Discipline and Punishment. But when we look back into the 13th and 14th century in Central Europe, Uh, we can see that this was a time which was, yeah, which resistance against the feudal powers and also the church began to grow. And yeah, so for one reason, the religious supremacy was questioned and also the supremacy of the feudal lords. And in many of the riots, women actually represented a large part. So, for instance, the heretic women. In the 15th and beginning 16th century, the nobility and the church started a, yeah, you might call it counter-revolution, which is actually the origin of early capitalism. So there began those land expropriations. So, yeah, basically the robbery of the common land and also the separation of workers from their means of production, like separating them from the land and the soil. And this was also a time where the criminalization and stigmatization of women began to grow. So women were displaced from craft traits and for uh, a lot of guilt. And also it was the beginning of a really repressive bio, bio, like biopolitics um, because of famine. Um, there was a decline in the necessary labor force. So, yeah, we can see that there's like a huge attack on female autonomy over re reproduction and their bodies. So, for instance, um, non-generative sexuality was repressed or um, child killing women were persecuted and also abortion was illegalized. Um, which is also interesting is that at this time midwives and women healers who for centuries had been yeah, on the side of women um, at birth, but also in times of sickness, um, were displaced by the male doctor. Um, yeah, so we can actually see that for, on the one side you have this attack on the sexual self-termination, for instance, with the... Um, repression of abortion and contraception and on the other hand you also have this attack on the economic self-determination with displacing women from a lot of professions actually leaving women no other choice than to stay at home and to fulfill this kind of yeah traditional role model that has been evolved since this time um, what is also interesting is that in the 16th century in Central Europe, women for the first time became legal subjects. Um, before, it was always the husbands who were liable to prosecution. And um, yeah, in the 16th and 17th century, more women were executed for infanticide than any other crime. Um, also... In the 16th century, it was the beginning of the first penitentiaries and workhouses for disciplining women and also children. So, for instance, in 1553, 
the Bridewell Palace in London was opening. And yeah, it was open to take homeless children and also punishing disorderly women. From 1556, so three years later, the place was used as a prison, hospital and school. Um, we also found the mention of the first prison for women in Spain in the 17th century. This was an institution for prostitutes, for begging women, and also for women employees who didn't perform their work properly. So the categories on the women incarcerated there were poverty, turned away from religion, and also women which didn't submit to their astrocratic employers. Um, when this church center was put into operation, the local judicial system published a statement saying, least any woman dare lounge around, idle or be without a husband. For the one who will dare to do so, she will be put in the galere, which is the name of the institution, and punished as she deserves. To be punished and as an example so that other women can see how they will fare and thus find themselves a husband to serve. It is decided that every girl who enters the village will be sent directly to the galere to introduce herself to the director's wife and ask her how to find a house to serve. And without registration, she will be sent to the galere for three days for being too limp. So that's also from the anarchist feminist um, Sin de Lira from Chile. And as we can see here, the kind of educational claim, if you might call it like this, is women to be serving a husband, to be hard working and God fearing with accepting their own oppression and yeah, and a, in a mean like breaking the resistance of women. And if we look back in history, it's also a step which was quite necessary to gain the unpaid labor power and the reproductive power necessary for the development of capitalism. Like, of course, also um, what was happening in the colonies and all the ex extractions of human um, life and resources there, but also this discrimination of women. And... Yeah, this attack on the self-determination of women and especially their body and gender and sex is something that has a quite clear continued th through history. So, yeah, we can see it basically in the last 200 years with the sanction of women who do not comply with certain norms, um, always with this look at sexuality and the body of women and something which is probably quite present in this case is the Nazi times in Germany where um, disorderly women were sent to concentration camps and also to working camps and a lot of these women were like even with the end of Nazi times not like I don't know like the repression just, just went on they, they were criminalized under the same um, laws that had been there before and there wasn't a lot of empathy for those women at all. Well, I'm trying to decolonize my mind This may take time But I promise I will start I light on the darkest corners of my heart To so unlearn the racist and oppressive ideologies That are ingrained in the fabric of our society I May not realize they're there, but they are But if we know where we are and where we're from We might know how we all can be
guest here on Indigenous Soil And my brother, you've been a gracious host I'll endeavor to earn my keep And my sister, I'll do all that I can To defend me from misogyny At the root of this destructive band, the pillar to pillars of life itself. Moving forward's gonna be messy, but there's a hunger that knocks. We are rich, there are lessons for us all. of the elders and the land And to appropriate is not appropriate But there's a line that's fine And some are just right We will meet in a field And I can feel the sunshine On our faces now There'll be time for our tears to dry Moving forward boldly To this bright future I'm sure glad to have you by my side I know I see I choose possibility I know I see I choose possibility I'm trying to decolonize my mind This may take time But I promise I will start That was Buckman Co. with the song Decolonize and we're back in the studio with our show on women's jails. And we would like to give you now some kind of facts and statistics to have a, yeah, I don't know, to just give it some numbers to have an understanding what we are talking about. And generally, you can say that worldwide there are around 700,000 women in prison. And uh, in Germany, it's in the way that, like, the federal statistics from December 2019, so two months ago, say that there are 47,500 or 47,600 men are in prison and 2,970 women. So you can see already that it's quite a, like the men's are way, like the numbers um, are kind of really different. So um, we can say that 5.8 of all prisoners in Germany are women. So that's actually not so much as you might actually um, expect. And um, I said already at the beginning that there are around seven um, so-called women's prison. And one is in Saxony, in Chemnitz, and it has 210 places in this kind of um, closed prisons. And um, yeah, who is there actually or why are people there? Um, this really kind of differs like the average age um, is kind of mainly between 30 and 40 is 1060. So, yeah. And um, oh, now it gets a bit complicated with the numbers to really get it 
see the diagram. I don't have the diagram, so <laughs> I'm trying to um, to tell it to you without the diagram and understand it myself. And between 40 and 50, it's kind of you have 700. So um, like the main crowd is actually between 30 and 40. And there are also 165 girls who are sitting in the juvenile prison, but um, actually in the German prison system, there is no uh, such thing as an extra juvenile panel system for girls. It's only for women. And so the girls usually have to sit in the in the adult prison, in the general prison. Um, which is, yeah, already fucked up because you, usually in the juvenile prison you have really different conditions and f those girls for sure cannot kind of rely on that. Um, taking like how are we now we've talked about who, which age are, which age are um, people in prison and now we want to have a look on the question how long are people actually in prison And um, actually the biggest among of people is kind of serving less than one year. So it's around 60% serving less than one year. That already shows that most probably the most of the things people are actually sentenced to are not really something really serious. Um, most of them have already been in prison once, actually. It's like... A, Yeah, like, yeah, as I said, most of them were already in prison before. And um, as we I already mentioned before, that prison is kind of reproducing violence. So this also indicates that the prison is not helping anybody, especially not the people who are inside. And that often leads to that people can't change their life. They are even more in this kind of patterns the society is forcing them in which brings them to prison again and the most um, um, reasons why people are actually in there are offenses of property so i mentioned before already that one reason is kind of poverty why people are in prison and um yeah around um so it's around 66 percent and um also there are a lot of drug offenses And this is not just coming out of the thin air, actually, because um, there are a lot of social problems, or as we mentioned before, there are a lot of reasons why people are, yeah, um, in prison. And we know that we are living in a patriarchal society and that there are a lot of things which forces people to do certain things and where people have a lot of, yeah, bad experiences and... Um, so uh, there are this number that actually 53% of women and 72% of men in prison were actually physically or sexually abused uh, when they were children. So this kind of um, women often have violent fathers or partners who uh, maybe not con didn't contribute to the family's needs and were often sexually abused. And this kind of gender-specific development and socialization conditions tend to lead to a resigned, inward-looking approach to the problems often, which leads to alcohol and drug abuse. So, or physical problems and serious psychological illnesses. But this kind of drug abuse is then the point which brings actually a lot of people in prison. So you already deal with this fucked up situation of your life. And um, yeah, this is the way... A lot of people deal with that, and this is what it, yeah, kind of know. There doesn't seem a solution to come out of this kind of circle. And um, pe like people who are really there for serious crimes is actually often conflict offenses, which occur mostly in the really kind of immediate family environment. So you also can see that this often relates with violent structures inside of the family. And um, we also mentioned before that there are a lot of women who are in male prisons uh, with the women section, so that they're not in the specific women um, prison. 
And there the problem is that this kind of administrative reg administrative regulations concerning prisons are usually then derived from the problem of the men's prison. But they also affect, of course, the women's prison, because that's basically one prison and must be implemented in the same way, regardless of uh, whether the same problems occur in the women's prison. And this kind of emancipatory goals, such as solving relationships of violence, independence um, or gaining independence, are not particularly important. And um, yeah, so actually the, the situation for women who are in these women's sections in the male prisons are even worse than in the in this so-called women's prison. And yeah, so what is the situation in the prison then eventually? I think I mentioned it already before. It's a kind of a really violent place where um, people are facing sexual abuse and rape and there are actually no really exact figures available about how many are affected by that. And um, also... What, yeah, the medical care in the prison is generally poor, but um, women have specific health requirements, like, for example, pregnancy or menstruation. And this is a really big issue, actually. Um, and, I mean, also, we were already talking about um, poverty and health is something which is strongly linked to the question of class, actually. And um, a lot of people already come with poverty-related health problems in the prison. And, um, yeah, you usually don't leave the prison with with uh, better health than you actually come in. I mean, there's no proper food, there's no proper conditions, there's no, yeah, there's hard labor. And, yeah, so it just gets worse, actually, in this kind of institutions. <laughs> So one other point, um, well, we were talking about the situations in the prison, actually, before the music. And um, just to uh, um, one really, we already said that there are only seven prisons for speci uh, spe specifically for women. 
And um, which brings up the point that usually you actually got imprisoned quite close to your the place where you're coming from or where you're living. And with this kind of fear among of prisons, this is hardly possible, um, almost impossible, which means that actually, um, yeah, a lot of like the families, maybe they are even already um, poor, um, don't have actually because of really long visit routes the possibility to visit you, which kind of punish the women again because they are already in the prison, then they are not kind of can't have relationship with their um, relatives and friends and um, yeah and actually yeah and um, also in the taking into account the kind of social situation or the the situation is really kind of fucked up we have in Kemets we said 210 prisoners and um, for these 210 prisoners we have six social workers so you I don't know. Can you imagine that this is for sure not enough? And um, also the question of, uh, we were talking already that there's a big problem with drugs and to get a kind of a rehab or at least some kind of counseling on that question is almost impossible for a lot of people even. So that would be a reasonable reason to do if you're already sitting in this fucked up prisons. And to kind of give an idea about... We already mentioned the health system, that this is kind of pretty fucked up in prison. We would like to read you a letter from an inmate who described a personal situation of hers. For some time now, I have had extreme shoulder complaints, primarily caused by incorrectly adjusted glasses. Due to the limited field of vision available, my values have deteriorated considerably over the past 29 months, which means that I now need a fourth pair of new glasses. The doctor has also ordered this at the end of October 2019. Already at the beginning of November, the money for it was blocked. The necessary optician appointment is now at the beginning of January 2020. All because the medical nurses who were present at the doctor's consultation thought I wanted the glasses because of literally looking chic. At the beginning of December, I was in the JVA Goldlaute, where I presented my complaints. Without any application bureaucracy, I was immediately allowed to go to med. I was completely speechless. I was allowed to go to med without any application? What's the catch? Nothing. The Met was mega nice and courteous. A totally new experience. Unfortunately, a doctor was not there. I was offered pills, heat ointment or heat plaster. I refused the pills and the ointment for health reasons. No problem at all. Then just take the heat plasters. And no complaining that, yeah, if you don't want to take them, you don't have any pain, which is standard talk in cabinets. No, on the contrary, if there's anything else, I should come back. Wow, there are still people in prison. Even the staff asked me next morning whether everything was okay or I wanted to go to the med again. Then I went again and got some more heat plasters. In cabinets, these were destroyed for cost reasons like so many other things that would help us. Because in our eyes, we're only, or in, because in their eyes, we're only third-class people. Every day we feel this. And this is especially noticeable in the medical care. You even have to be insulted. This is what happened to a fellow inmate last week. She had a cold and went to work out of a sense of duty. In order to get medication, she went to the doctor, who called her bitch in Ukrainian. Just stupid that she understood. He then refused her the medication. Absolutely daily norm here in the prison in Chemnitz. You have to be insulted here almost daily, whether by the staff or medical service. Human rights are trampled on. Our standard saying is that we hand our human rights at the gate and receive them again on release. Some people might think that that's an exaggeration, I sincerely wish it was so, but in fact, it's reality. Don't 
someday get beaten and not as locked up for fighting for a world that's less fucked up. And if you think different, and if you misbehave, they will lock you up. They will put you in a cage. So let's burn, burn the prisons down. Burn, burn the prisons down. That objects getting tight with your hands to your bed, and this is what they call justice. This is what they call fair. So let's burn, burn the prisons down, burn, burn the prisons down. Let's tear apart the walls that keep us from each other. And I wish I knew you were safe, but you just never know in the hands of the state. So let's burn, burn the prisons down. Burn, burn the prisons down. Let's tear apart the walls that keep us from each other. Let us tear apart the walls that keep us from each other. Let's tear apart the walls that keep us from each other. And you are back here on Elephant in the Room on Color Radio. And we are talking today about uh, women's prison as an institution. We talked already about the history and about kind of, yeah, who's in the prison, why are there people are actually in the prison and what are the actual situation. And um, two more qu uh, points on that. So first, the working conditions in the uh, 13th of 16 German federal states, the work is actually duty. And uh, if you refuse to work, you are threatened with confinement, like spending 23 hours in a nine square meter cell, for example. And um, yeah, prison work has become a welcome source of income, actually. And the inmates earn one to three euro per hour for an eight hour daily shifts with quite hard labor and um, there's for example no pension entitled you have no social insurance or things like that and um, some companies are actually so fucked up actually to pro uh, to label their products like produced in germany who are producing in the prison for example um, companies who are doing that, like who are producing in the prison is Miele or Volkswagen or this garden tool manufacturer Gardena, Siemens, Mercedes-Benz and BMW. Also for insurance companies and banks like Sparkasse, prisoners are folding tens of thousands of brochures every day. And um, the problem is actually that that you are poor when you're in prison because it's if you're in the for a criminal case in prison there is no possibility to get money for example even if your relatives or friends would like to give you money it's impossible so you're kind of you don't have anything so that's why people are actually forced to work to at least get some of the few things you can get in this uh, prison shops to make your life a little bit better um, now we want to talk about the mother and child or the family situation in prison in generally so in uk about two-thirds of the women in prison are mothers 
In Germany, the original idea for this mother-child department, which are installed in the prisons right now, came from the 70s, where the idea was to re-socialize the women with the help of their child. So the child was like a convenient mean um, for making the women more dutiful or something. And today, like putting the child with the women is explained with this early childhood bond um, as a mother should not be separated from the child. Um, two percent of women in Germany could take their children to jail. Um, for instance, in Jotva Chemnitz, there are 256 places in the closed prison and which I don't have uh, mother child places and there are five mother child places in the like open um prison where you spend um spend the night and then you can go for instance working during the day and um, there the kids can be up to 3 years with their moms but it's actually not so easy to fulfill the requirements so like some points from the list of requirements you have to fulfill are you do not need to have any drug, alcohol, or medication problems. The youth welfare office needs to consent. And also the mothers must be suitable for open prison accommodation. And yeah, more often the detainees cannot meet those requirements. And which is another point is that the distance from home are also in a lot of cases too long to bring their children. Um... In the UK prisons, um, there are places where mothers can bring their children up to 18 months. And also there, those mother-child rings are really limited spaces, which also need the cooperation with the authorities, um, which actually leads also to a competition for places, which yeah, is not so nice to be in the situation of having a child and then yeah, needing to compete and also having this idea yet that you might also be taking away this um, this benefit, some might call it. Um, in Germany, there's also this thing called housewives leaves. So mothers can take care of their children um, during the day, which is like um, associated with work. But the problem is that they have to pay the transport costs themselves, um, which if you imagine that there are only seven jails in Germany for women and um, this is quite a long transport or it might be by quite a long transport and it might not be even doable in one day and also it kind of pushes this traditional image of of women taking care of the kids in the household um, which is really interesting is that there's like this special stigmata for women which are in prison um, especially when they're mothers and yeah it gets a lot worse if they're, for instance, um, POC or if they're poor, then, yeah, you have this really deeply um, culturally um, stigmata of, like, being a bad mother. So maybe this also is one reason to explain the high suicide rates in women's prisons. But not only for the mothers, also for the children, it's super hard to have parents in prison so a lot of children are super lonely lose their social environment get health problems and also have to live with poverty and stigmata so often as i mentioned before there's this reformist approach that imprisoning women harms children but we want to be quite clear on the matter that locking parents away generally harms children regardless which gender the parents have. And if you look at the numbers of men in prison, then, yeah, it's such a huge amount of families which are being teared apart and lonely children that, yeah, this is completely missing in the discussion of what do prisons do to children. It's always focused on the mothers, which is also this gender-specific um, stigmata placed on women. Um, yeah, so prison destroy families, whether any parent is behind bars. 
Um, yeah, as I said before, the societies we live in do not accept people with prison background, which um, is quite paradox, as we always have this um, lie of re-socialization. Re oh, I cannot even pronounce this word. Um, that people like being punished and then they, you know, work in the prison, get better people, and then they come out and are back into society but it doesn't work like this at all there's a huge stigmata for people who have been in prison um, they have been turned away from their social surrounding from their work and especially for women it's super hard to get back um, in their families in their workplaces if they still exist to catch up with friends and many of these women um, which also got into prison because of um, for instance, the violence of partners or in general, the violent society we live in are even more discriminated against and have to return to their to their maybe violent partners. We say goodbye at the beginning of the night When the rest of this little town will turn off their bedroom lights We say goodbye before we hit the road Because the paths we take are not the ones that everybody knows We say goodbye with this fear in our hearts About the people who will do their best to tear our worlds apart We say goodbye not knowing the next time we will meet And if there's a chance that we will be alive Cause we don't know how far they will go with us this time So let's tell each other that we love them whenever we can Let's keep each other as safe as we possibly can Be careful, keep quiet, most important of all Don't push the ones you love far enough for them to fall Cause when we fall, we can't stick together We have to stick together We have secrets, we have treasures We have our plans, but they can never be measured by the ways of consequence Cause we can't be sure how fucked up the state decides to react So we burn So we, yeah, kind of highlighted some aspects today about this institution, so-called women prisons. There's a lot more to say and a lot of more problems to point on, but unfortunately we just have one hour. So this was a short overview towards some aspects. Important it is to be in solidarity, to be in solidarity with the people who are inside the prison, because they are not just victims of this unjust system, but they're also people who act and who organize and people with good ideas and energy and people who need our support to kind of go through this prison. And that's why we are going on the 7th of March now for the first time to the women's prison in Chemnitz in Saxony here in Saxony. And there will be a big demonstration and it's always pretty touching actually to arrive to this prison and to get in touch with the um, inmates there. And so we really would like to invite you to join us this year. There will be uh, awesome music for the people inside of the prison. There will be uh, emotional speeches and a lot of greeting words. And there will be a lot of power brought to the people. And yeah, so um, it's on you to join us on the 7th of March at 1 p.m. in Chemnitz at Reichenhainer Straße, which is to the close to the or it's in the university. And there will start the anti-prison demonstration to the prison in Chemnitz. Afterwards, there will be food and the concert as well. So that's a lot of reasons to come with us to Chemnitz. And this was us for today. Oliver in the room. And we will hear each other in two weeks. Yeah.
secrets, we have treasures. We have our plans, but they can never be measured by the ways of consequence. Cause we can't be sure how fucked up the state decides to react. So we burn no secrets, our messages, and find it hard to trust every single person that we are. time so let's tell each other that we love them whenever we can let's keep each other safe as we possibly can be careful keep quiet most important of all don't push the ones you love far enough for them to fall because when we fall we can't stick together we have to stick together I see that you've been beaten, I see the cut you deep into your very existence. If you need to take some time, if you need to get away, we can all work together to find somewhere warm and try to stay. This will never be safe, this will never be easy. We will need to call our parents to let them know we're still breathing. But if we hold each other near every step of the way, then maybe it'll be better, maybe it'll be better. So let's tell each other that we love them whenever we can. Let's keep each other safe as we possibly can. Be careful, keep quiet, most important of all. Don't push the ones you love far enough for them to fall. Cause when we fall, we can't stick together. We have to stick together.